So how do we um, include them in our work, in our uh, mainstreaming with our projects? It is because 80 to 85 percent of people don't need many expensive or high priced or huge or cumbersome accommodations. Many more than 60 percent do not require any accommodations. They can manage, but it is the last 15 percent. And since we are talking about the sustainable development goals and we are emphasizing again and again, leave no one behind. That is the reason we need to understand this 15 percent among women with disabilities who need support environment, who need these reasonable accommodations to be part of our deliberations, to be part of our day to day activities, to be part of our schools, our colleges, our workplaces, to run a family, to have children and to live a dignified life or for that matter, even go and vote. So number one, we know it is a huge population. Number two, is it is a heterogeneous population, it's not homogeneous. Number three, it faces a lot of barriers, this population. So what barriers? Physical barriers, communication barriers, but the most important barrier as far as I am concerned and the kind of discrimination, the kind of harassment I suffered after the initial years of my accident, it is attitudinal discrimination. The big problem, Phobia. A lot of people are afraid of us. I remember one senior bureaucrat when I went and met him. Then disability was parked under women and child development. So I go and meet this officer. Very nice person. Then he tells me, Shruti, I don't know anything about disability. I have only three months left to retire. I don't want to learn new things now. After, because I have to do a lot of closing, a lot of widening up. So please forgive me, but I will not be able to do justice for your sector in these three months. So you are afraid even without understanding what is the issue. Had he just given me 15 minutes, understood the issue, there was no fear for him. He could have done something for some sector. Number two, huge apprehension. Oh, I went and met a Navratna company managing uh, the chairman, chairman, the what do they call them? Chairman come managing director. Again, a very nice person. I said, how is it that you're a Navratna company, government of India company? You've got 70 people. Just now. Yes. yes. Uh, sorry for interruption. Pradnya, can you please go on mute? Uh, just uh, yeah, a request to everyone again. Please so continue. The gentleman tell, I you see we have given appointment to 70 students. I said, you have given appointment to 70, but 45 of them your medical board has rejected. This is, this 70 posts are for people with disabilities. There are 30 hearing impaired women standing in front of your office. They have all qualified. Your medical team has disqualified all of them saying they are hearing impaired, they cannot do anything. It is a, a hard, uh, uh, what is called energy and strength requiring. So women, we cannot take. So the apprehension of without interacting with people with disabilities, the decisions that people are taking at the higher authorities, that is one major barrier for us that needs to change. Number three, so one is fear, one is apprehension. One is I recently found a growing I had experienced this is the Western companies is the hate crimes, the anger for reservation. Very recently, I have started getting a feel of this in some of the panchayat areas that I was traveling in, meeting the Sarpanch and the village people. And very frankly, they were saying because of this reservation, qualified young people of our young women. I think there was a selection for Anganwadi workers. So qualified young women who can do better job in our Ranganwadi centers were rejected and your, it was directly he told me, your women with disabilities were selected. It's a different thing that we took up this challenge with this 30 women. One of them won an award at the state level for excellent work performed by her. So this little difference, how do we 
remove that. So if these three things are removed, one is barriers, one is understanding the heterogeneous population, one is understanding it's a huge population with large number, then women with disabilities can be easily mainstream. Now coming to the topic that we are dealing today and touching upon violence, you see, global data on gender-based violence against women with disability is limited, but UNFPA had led an initiative and they found that 14 to 68% of women with disabilities are experiencing sexual violence even before the age of 18. In 2012, we had traveled, a group of us had traveled across Odisha and it was mostly we wanted to meet uh, parents of aspirational young people with disabilities. One of the communities where large number of women came and talked about their daughters was deaf women. The mother said the deaf girls, very aggressive, could not speak vocally, very aggressive, very assertive, they said, our close family members are sexually exploiting us in the four walls of the house. My mother says, don't say anything. And the mother said, what can I do? These are the people who are going to take care of her all her life. So she has to remain quiet and bear with it. So these kind of things are happening to all girl child with disabilities, whoever is vulnerable, whoever is, is a high support need women with disability, who has a lot of challenges, who is not educated, who is not able to fend for herself. Sexual uh, exploitation has become a major, major, uh, what you call uh, uh, harassment in their lives. Coming to the COVID-19 pandemic, the lockdown and the impact of it. We did a survey here in the urban poor areas of Bhubaneswar. Our children, we met about 323 children. Most of the children said that during the pandemic, when the father was hungry and drunk, when the mother was very stressed, siblings were very stressed, they used to get over their frustration by beating these children with disabilities because they could not run away. Coming to food, not one, not two, but I, as, as far as my knowledge goes, about five non-government organizations, international organizations, someone like even CBM and a couple of others. We did an assessment of nutrition, nutritional gaps and we found that children with disabilities have started developing secondary disabilities, people who could go to regular therapy have developed curvatures, people who had started speaking a few words are regressing, people who could sit and stand are back on the bed. So nutritional supplements were provided. But what was the end result? When we went to house after house to survey, we found that the eggs, the milk that was meant for this child who had become further weak, who had regressed in uh, therapy, who was could not stand, could not walk, could not speak, the food was being equally distributed with all the milks. Another challenge that we faced, especially for girl child with disability is a lot of organizations and, give, and even government got some extra funds for them. But this fund was again utilized for the general family and for her what you call dignified menstru menstruation or her extra food needs. None of these were taken care of. We have uh, got examples of a pregnant woman with disability who lost her baby because despite several calls, there was no one to attend to her at her house during the COVID time. We know about the leprosy colonies where the regular doctors who visited them stopped going there. The nursing staff who cleaned their wounds, who treated them, they did not visit these colonies. So violence is not taking one form of verbal or physical violence, but violence is getting manifested in many forms when it comes to disability. In not sitting with the family and eating together, in not take, getting a regular bath, psychosocially disabled women have remained unbathed for months whom we met. 
they don't uh, they are not allowed to join in family functions in social gatherings and when money is limited it is always the child with disability and ultimately the girl child with disability who share gets limited with this i rest my words i think all of us in every stream that we are working in we need to take this concerns into our heart because i have interacted with them for over 30 years now every child every girl child every woman with disability is unique they have a lot of potential what we need to provide is a supportive environment support them with whatever reasonable accommodations they need thank you very much thank you uh, dr mahapatra and you know as as i've always felt listening to you uh, you bring an unparalleled passion details and advocacy and thanks for ending with uh, a call to action on that especially on the point about how gender and disability intersect and on a day to day level the vulnerability that it creates and we hear these stories uh, across whenever you go to the communities Uh, on that note, I will come back to you with few follow-up questions, but I would request now uh, Audrey uh, to kindly kind of make an opening pitch, and if it's possible, because there are two leading questions that I wanted you to integrate in your response, is primarily to get uh, you know any references that might be there related to judgments on food security uh, and gender-based violence, and also is there any kind of connecting GBV survivors? Uh, Uh, linking with livelihood and nutrition so yeah i mean you can structure it your way but over to you i hope i am audible and clear yes thank you so much thank you yeah over to you uh thank you so much uh, for having me here and i think uh, it's interesting that the 16 days of activism has made a lot of organizations address this issue and we see a lot of active participation in organizations to to, to address the issue of gender based violence um so though it may sound like we do these cursory you know bits of international women's day or 16 days of activism i do feel like they do make small differences in the way people think and in the way people are responding so thank you uh un uh, world food program for having this uh, meeting um uh, i think uh, i just want to start by saying that i work with an organization called majlis and uh, majlis started 30 years ago we are a team of women lawyers and social workers and uh, we started with the intention of access to justice to women uh the reason why we started was our founders were part of the women's movement the autonomous women's movement from the 1980s and um you know the whole of the 1980s was a decade of laws for women uh facing various violence uh we've got the you know we we managed to get criminalization of domestic violence in 1983 we managed to get increased um increased punishment for cases of rape um we got child marriage act was amended we got the pcp ndt act so that sex determination of children does not happen and so on and so forth i can just list so many laws that came in the name of women but i just want to take us back to a time where why why this focus on women and i think um one of the very very strong visuals if some of you were around at that time was uh, women dying in their homes um it was initially called the stove burst cases so you know very strangely uh, stoves would burst in uh, in kitchens and young brides very very young brides would die and you know people were wondering whether you know that this was the defaulting stoves that were causing it or what was happening uh, but very soon this started getting the name of dowry harassment um, which which really meant that uh, because a dowry was demanded during marriage and we, you know families had to pay dowry who couldn't pay dowry and then women were burnt alive 
So, you know, the 80s, early 80s, you will see this really beautiful bride all decked up in one side and a completely charred body of a woman on the other. And they were called dowry cases. Um, it led to such an uproar uh, and it led to so much of movement on the ground uh, that the, the, the law had to take cognizance of these deaths. And uh, we got, you know, a section called uh, 304B, which unlike murder, what it tried to do was say that if any woman dies in her house within seven years of marriage, um, then uh, onus of proof that she was not killed would be on the husband and his family. And with that, we also got a criminalization of domestic violence under Section 498. These were actually new sections put into IPC to articulate what was happening in homes. Um, and as you know, IPC has been quite static for over 100 years. And yet these new sections came. And they came because they came on the back of women who had died, women who were murdered in their homes. Um, I think, I think what I want to uh, start by saying is that um, a lot of people say that, you know, this whole women's rights issue is very overrated and too much focus and, you know, everyone's having problems. So what is this big deal of, of this focus on, on, on women and violence against women? Um, I think what I what I have seen in my work of the of 15 years that I have been at Majlis and, and the 30 years of work that Majlis itself has done is that we see violence against women and girls as a continuum. You know, um, while you know, while we think of like women are getting married and they're burnt in their house and that's the issue, but actually it starts way back, you know. Uh, it's not like women suddenly get married and then face violence. The violence is starting very early on. And, um, you know, it starts almost at birth. Uh, just the whole selection of who should be born. And we know how much India is lagging on just this aspect. Because naturally more girls will be born if you allow the natural process. But yet India is like we're, we're seeing as low as 870 in a city like Bombay, uh, 2000 males. So, you know, there's a whole selection of who should be born. And once girls are born, the whole violence that starts, you know, should be very beautifully talked about disabilities so when it's coupled with disability or any other thing, but being woman itself is a disability, is considered a disability, is viewed as a disability and the violence starts very, very young. The violence starts with discrimination. The violence starts with what is provided, to, the difference between what is provided to girls and boys, the opportunities given. And one very important link that I had, I came to realize very late uh, was about nutrition. The fact that girls are provided less nutrition, that women eat last in a household, that we have all these innumerable fasts that are you know put on women in the name of protecting men or families or whatever ensures lack of nutrition to a level and according to me that whole upas and that fast that is put on women and the, the burden of that and the discrimination in food provided to girls leads to so much of malnutrition over the years that we did a study you know, where we try to look at what did husbands complain about in the women that, you know, when, when they wanted to ask for divorce. And they would say the woman was lethargic, she was not working, she was not, you know, contributing to the house. And, and so much of that is linked to lack of nutrition. All these, all these um, medical health issues, the psychological issues that women face is because of lack of nutrition, which is a gender-based violence that happens in the home. And thereafter, you know, we are constantly teaching girls and girls that they need to sit in a, a pro proper manner. They need to speak softly. They should not go out. There's a fear of the outside. There's a fear of the unknown. And we are teaching boys the exact opposite. We're telling them to be strong. We're telling them go out there and fight. We're telling them they have to be out there and work. And when we raise girls in this manner, with the ultimate dream that they need to be married, 
and this i'm not talking about socio economic class of a certain kind who is very low down i'm talking about you and me i'm talking about everyone sitting in this room and the pressure that you need to be married you are not complete you may be a doctorate you may be studying you may be earning it doesn't matter if you are not married you are not complete so girls are being raised with this with this whole idea that i have to be married and i have to save this marriage at any cost and families are literally selling their girls in order to be married because what we are saying is that you have to be married and you have to be married to the person of our choice you have to be married to a person of our choice who matches caste who matches class who matches you know all the all the factors that we think is okay and we are ready to pay for that marriage and even if we can't pay you know there is a study about women who died in their husband's home and in or we we read we read supreme court judgments of what was the story before that and in 95% of the cases the girls went back to their homes pleaded with their parents not to send them back but the parents still continued to send them back and it was at this breaking point that women died so you can see the whole pressure of marriage and then we wonder why are women you know facing domestic violence why are they accepting domestic violence why are they not standing up against domestic violence it is because there is no other option there is no other place where do you go your family refuses to to accept you back and so you continue to live there if you can live you live otherwise you die and then the whole pressure right the whole pressure that you stay married he will become better you know you adjust to this and you keep perpetuating this this trauma and this generational violence on next generation and next generation and that is why 30 years later i'm probably saying the same things that were said you know when when majlis started but the reality is that we have not been able to address what is happening in our homes and 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 a system you know this one in three women face domestic violence we have been hearing i have been hearing it for 15 years and and probably some of us for 30 years but that number continues and has increased so what happened were we not able to address this violence through law and the answer is yes we were not able to address it because in any other criminal uh, law if you have to address somebody who is the perpetrator of crime you would take it in all seriousness and fir would be lodged and investigation would be done a trial would be conducted but when it comes to domestic violence there is a very tacit understanding in families in the community but also among the state also among the police also among the judges that this in these cases we need to resolve this issue we need to patch up this marriage because the marriage has to be saved at all cost and so we are you know we are ready to do counseling we are ready to do any intervention as long as this woman can go back and live in that home and and we are not questioning that how come in all other crimes a, a perpetrator is treated as a criminal and is is dealt with in that manner because i am talking about violence to unheard of extent every day even today when i sit on consultations i am hearing about heads broken beaten to the level of bleeding bones broken thrown out not provided food not taking care desertion it is an everyday story at our office and yet the only solution that everyone is offering is how do we send her back and she herself is saying i want to go back so when we say that you know there is we, we've done you know violence against women for 30 years and now it's enough you know women should be stronger we have provided education we have done whatever it's it's not translating you know in the 16 days of activism in bombay there have been three instances of women who have jumped or committed suicide and died in bombay and in one case the woman jumped with her 5 year old child that is how much lack of hope is there that women are just just not 
finding answers to address this violence that is faced at home. And with this domestic violence comes sexual violence. You know, we, we have this impression that rape is happening and, you know, a Nirbhaya case is the ultimate example of where women are getting raped. And there is this whole fear that don't go out, you will be raped, don't go out at night, you will be raped. But that is not the reality. We work on victims, we, we work on cases of uh, sexual violence in Bombay. Uh, we've handled more than 2000 of cases of rape ourselves. And I can share with you that 95 to 98% of cases of rape are committed by known persons. And a good 20% of those cases are committed by close family members. And when I say close family members, I'm saying fathers and uncles and brothers. And this is the kind of violence Shruti talked about when it's disability, how sexual violence by family members who are also the caregivers are doing this. And this is so common. But we are not addressing that. We don't even want to touch it. Because how do you touch it? Where will you go? You know, you, you, you file a case. What will happen to that whole family that all of us are trying so hard to protect against all odds? So yes, there is law. There are a team number of Supreme Court judgments saying that, you know, we need to address this issue. Women are dying in their homes. You know, we are increasing laws. We are making more stringent laws. But we don't have the, how do I say, will. We don't have the will to solve this problem. It's not a problem that cannot be solved. It's just that we lack the will because we really put family on a pedestal and we think that if women are facing violence in our homes, then so be it. And that is the problem. So I'll stop here and maybe we can have a discussion a little later. Uh, thank you, Audrey. And you know, you that laid it bare uh, out there, like you always do. I think the two points you made, which are very important, is that while we keep struggling with the structural aspects of how it's institutionalized, how gender-based violence is perpetuated, accepted tacitly, the the aspect of uh, social norms, behaviors, and the reinforcement of that, which kind of viciously kind of makes it difficult even to seek help and you know suffer in silence. And I think that's one aspect that we've been also working very strongly on. And these change needs to happen on a day-to-day -day basis and even more strongly. And uh, one could sense the frustration, but also the determination with which you advocate this. Uh, we'll come back to you with a few uh, questions that are there as follow-up. But on that note, I would like to move to our uh, final panelist, uh, Sarika Kanna. So uh, Sarika, you know, uh, I would, I mean, with this, it's with a lot of hesitation that I would kind of <laughs> tell you what to talk about because I think you are so close to this issue, like all the other panelists, that you you do have your own pitch. But uh, you know, we just wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, your experience on rights of women and trajectories of gender-based movement uh, against the violence on women in India, and you know, maybe you could share some milestones that are there, but also importantly the global experiments lessons learned and and how is it different the way we experience it and all the progress or lack of progress that has happened and uh, what you're seeing from your global conversations in africa in in the north in, in any other countries and by way of just kind of offering uh, a, a comparison or analysis so over to you sarika thank you so much parvinder um, I think I'm going to reverberate a lot of what my uh, two predecessors have said here and uh, uh, also build on some of the things. Uh, but uh, first, let me tell you that, uh, you know, I'm basing a lot of what I'm about to tell you on my work with uh, women manual scavengers. They were both Hindus and Muslims, but they were all Dalit women, so Dalit Hindus and Dalit Muslims. Manual scavengers are women who lift night soil on their head. Uh, a proposed that I worked for about a decade with caste-based sex workers across the central part of India. And before we got into a time when incidentally Nirbhaya also happened, uh, across about two years, we went and investigated every rape that happened in Madhya Pradesh. And uh, Madhya Pradesh also happens to be sort of al always the topper, you know, in a very, very negative sense when it comes to sexual assault. 
at the end of which we did a public hearing. And uh, I, I remember that some thousand of us walked on the roads in Gwalior, which incidentally also has a very, very adverse sex ratio. And uh, as we walked on the road, we with the try point that we were trying to establish were twofold. One, uh, you know, we all live in a rape culture. So whether I have been raped or not, I'm constantly under the fear that it can happen to me. And that takes away a lot of my own agency as an individual. The second part, of course, was it's not the raped person who is stigmatized, right? Which, which incidentally is something that's that's very, very prevalent in our societies. A proposed that the government asked us to come with a tangible solution, tangible under court, since they don't talk about feminist justice and don't give us that jargon. Just come up with a tangible solution. And then we began uh, somewhat, which was one of the first one-stop crisis centers in India called Gauruvi. And we very specifically named it uh, that way because it means brave heart. Our own experience prior to that with about 20 decades of uh, 20 years of work was that, you know, uh, only four out of 10 incidences of violence get reported. And with a conviction rate of between 19 to 25 percent, we know that out of 10, there is only one who's getting convicted. So you really have to be brave to register your cases, given what you will go through and what happens thereafter. Now, um, having said that, I, I want to begin by saying that, you know, this uh, I find the term violence against women itself very, very discursive, very, very standalone, because I think that takes away and makes it very, very depoliticized. And and, and I, let me also tell you, as somebody who has been in the midst of these 16 days of uh, of activism, I have now begun to introspect and critique it quite a bit. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, it, it takes away the fact that it is very, very interwoven and deeply seeded in a lot of other very, very deep issues. And, and you know, just takes it away and puts it somewhere and, and we do these 15 days and we feel happy. Nevertheless, I don't say that it should not be done. I do feel that it, it's something that we need to put a focus on and not forget it. Now, my own work with women was uh, brought to me the first thing that uh, th that that registered was the intersectional analysis so which is something that my predecessors both have spoken about shruti more in detail so my learning was that you know women, women are not a homogeneous group and and you, you know we have to have uh, a very very uh, uh, a, an analysis which talks about injustice from an angle of difference and uh, and hence that that brought about a learning that that, you know, there is no universality of rights. So rights are very, very polyversal. So access to rights and, you know, what what whether you will be justice or not depends a lot on what your identity is. And hence, you know, there is a lot of cultural relativism there as well. Now, um, now. The other thing that I keep feeling when I look back uh, across my own work and, and introspect and retrospect and critique it as well is, you know, most of the times uh, our uh, 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 the coming together of the feminist movement and a lot of other people who, who support it has invariably been around individual and individual cases. And, and you know, uh, so so we we our subject is this particular woman, and, and that also not in very subjecthood style, but but rather a victim. and and that that takes away the focus that we need to build on the society. And uh, sometimes, you know, also leads to an accepting or even normalizing of of this kind of violence. And given the sheer magnitude of violence, something that that uh, I think Audrey was talking about, uh, I remember that in, in Gwalior Morena, where we used to work with, with women, and we would closely monitor women who had given birth to three girl children already, and if they were pregnant the fourth time, or even two girl children already. I came across women who spoke about how they had killed their children, and trust me, you don't want to know. And you know, if you look at Lancet uh, data, it says about 3.5 crore uh, fetuses are missing. And and that brings me to another learning, which is around the body politics and politics of recognition, with, which is around autonomy. So how do we deal with interventions of violence against women in a more sustained manner and not as a single issue are, are some of the issues that that I have constantly felt and and uh, and thought about now. Um, 
the, the first thing uh, that I want to draw out of my own work with the One Stop Crisis Center was the framing of violence against women as a human, as, as a health issue. And that is very important. But, but you know, uh, it, it's, it's very important because the health system is often the first contact where a woman comes. And, and it's also a system when a, when a woman faces violence, what are the places she can go to? She can go to her community, but that obviously hasn't succeeded because if that had, we wouldn't have this kind of uh, data around violence. She can go to a police station, but we all know what happens in a police station. She can go to a court straight away, but courts are mostly inaccessible. Or she can go to a hospital to get herself treated. And I think that is the thought with which we started our one-stop crisis center in the, in the main government hospital in Bhopal. But you know the learnings that that uh, you know, despite the fact that it became uh, began as a one-stop kind of a temporary uh, center, my learning is that you know uh, women face intergenerational poverty, right? So from mother mother to the girl, and malnutrition, anemia, you know, uh, the multiple miscarriages that they face is something very systemic and structural. So how do you compare the two and link violence with with uh, the, uh, the food security or her basic health needs? The second thing was, uh, you know, around sexual violence is something that I would really want to talk about. Um, I, I remember once that there was this young woman who had uh, refused sexual favors to her husband. And I remember when she walked into the one stop crisis center, that she was uh, she was burnt on her breasts and uh, for about three days she hadn't received any e e even the first aid so her her rotten body had begun to smell when she had come in and this is just one of the examples that i'm taking i remember many women writing to us or telling us very secretly how they did not want to have sex but could not refuse it and 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 I think that's where it, it, it got to me that how sexuality, more or less, your entire being is hinged on sexuality. And while we came across multiple incidences of sexual violence uh, outside the house, let me tell you that the violence inside homes was no less. So whether it was marital rape at the hands of the husband or, or a father who thought that the mother's ghost would always enter the daughter and would, would rape her very, very frequently. Uh, incest was something that we came across very, very uh, uh, frequently. But the point apart from this, apart from the incidents that I'm trying to establish is how uh, highly do we value our sexual purity? Is if as if our entire identity and our entire being depends on one part of the body, right? So for for girls who were raped, I remember her uh, their their siblings would not be able to go to school. We had to ensure that these girls were taken out from their community because uh, you know despite the fact that we do not mention the names, newspapers invariably mention the places, and so people make two plus two in small towns and they more or less know who got raped. We also came across many incidences of girls delivering children and, and, and you know, uh, the whole judgments around not being able to uh, abort your child and big uh, ballyhoo by very, very fascist religious groups uh, uh, asking us not to uh, promote abortion, you know. And and so so that was something. This so you know your entire entity, your your autonomy and your bodily integrity is something that is constantly at threat, and uh, it it is not a one time thing. The second thing that I want to talk about violence against women in my own work is more as a capability issue, and capability the way Amartya Sen talks about it, the way when what you can do and what can you be, you know, depends a lot on on the external factors. So. I remember that that very few women contraception was everyone else's job apart from the person who was conceiving. So, you know, you could not you had absolutely no bargaining power to say that you did not want another child, even if you had given birth to male children. And I'm sorry for saying that. But uh, women would come and write to us. They would tell us that they don't want to have another child. 
the second thing was you know the the fact that the fear of sexual harassment would take away a child from school and i remember that in bachra beria nat kanjar sansi communities which are sex worker communities or actually they are performing arts but they were put in, as a denotified right i remember that none of the girls could go to school for the simple fact that everyone else knew what community they belonged to and and you know just just found it very easy to be able to touch them to have access to them or even to rape them and so you know you denying you this capability of even even having access to education attempts to take up work are invariably met with a lot of violence and so you know because it breaks that binary of male breadwinner and female caregiver model and uh, the the core again you know of a woman's being is the control over her sexuality and how that leads to capabilities right uh, and the last thing that i want to talk about is you know uh, talking about violence against women as an economic issue so uh, and and in that i want to bring out some of the studies that are being done across and let me tell you that uh, one thing that you were asking me parvinder about quoting international examples so across australia across bangladesh you know people have picked up the cases of one stop crisis centers and uh, there are a lot of claims being made they are not though they are not very very holistic about how it reduces violence but uh, having having been closely a part of one i have very serious doubts about it so while it can be a stop gap arrangement i am not so certain that you know it will bring about a change in how people think but uh, nevertheless to come into the economic issue which is something that has not been researched much in india you know there are a couple of care work studies that you see but when it comes to violence against women i think i found one when i was interacting with people across jamaica like they say that uh, the total budget out of the total budget about 0.6% of their total budget is actually spent on the treatment of violence violent sur- survivors now in chile and in nicaragua where they have calculated a couple of things they say that the wages lost due to domestic violence uh, are tantamount to something between 1.5 to 2% of their gdp and in delhi i think there were a couple of studies which spoke about how after when nirbhaya happened there was a loss of 40% in productivity how women withdrew from work so it's it's while while this 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 is the first, this is a kind of crime and a milieu in which the violence is on you but you are the one who is being withdrawn from from the entire picture so so there are studies but you know i i don't want to but the real question is not about how economically important a woman is i think it's much much deeper than that and uh, we know that all forms of power including the use of violence are are based on a very strong material base so if you look at the gender division of labor within the family if you look at the the whole masculine protector and the feminine protected model they, they ensure that there is a reification of the ontological divide between the public and the private so if you are at home you are uh, you will incidentally face that ehsaas ehsaane se kamtari and uh, you know i don't want to talk about resources because i think a lot of studies have been done about it but uh, just uh, and and look at what uh, the neoliberal reforms have done to women how uh, and and in this this form of neoliberal reforms of uh, liberalizing women's labor is not just very very uh, gendered it's also very very raced so uh, in in canada where i live now the most of the people who come to work are from mexico most of the uh, the big shops that are there are by primark or or by walmart and they hi- they are into hyper exploitation of a woman's labor and that's something that we need to deal with a little more and the last thing that i want to say before i i break it is you know how the state itself is a gendered institution so it 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 kind of uh, tries to deal with uh, a very very deeply rooted issue in a very very law and order manner but it nevertheless has a very very strong regulatory gaze on people who are not in the heteronormative typical married uh, lives so you know if you look at these people who are surplus whether they are queer or whether sex workers and uh, 
single women for that matter and i find the concept itself very very paradoxical uh there is a lot of biopolitics and necropolitics that that happens with them so who is made to live and who is allowed to die also has a very strong gendered class caste and religious character also a colonized character and and that's where i'll stop for now uh thank you sarika and you know i mean uh, a lot of what you said uh, you know we we kind of uh, discussed uh, at various times and various phases especially the work that uh, happened uh, you know with disappearing daughters campaign that was done but uh, you know the way you were able to uh, integrate this uh, is, is is really insightful and thank you so much for that uh incidentally we are uh, you know at the end of the allocated time there aren't many questions that i can ask which goes on to prove two things uh, and i hope one of them is not correct which is that it was a discussion among people who believe very strongly and who want to work on these issues and uh, or that you guys have addressed everything very very clearly and comprehensively but either ways i think the conversation was very very important uh you know some of the takeaways really and and one can't really sum up because we we were all on the same page but two significant takeaways that are clear is that uh, even as we continue struggling on a day to day basis at professional spaces through research policy campaigns you know grassroots interventions and all uh things seems to kind of keep getting more and more difficult for women different forms and the shadow pandemic was a clear example of that during covid it aggravated the example that dr mahapatra pointed out i mean we've been witness to that for a long time about how the vulnerability of women especially women with disability and all of the different forms of marginalization whether it's based around caste age and the single woman status for various reasons ranging from witch hunting to be sent off with a uh, able bodied sister uh, as as a gift to you know marriages that is happening so that they can live their life in servitude so there is a lot that you know is happening and we are continuing to raise voices but structurally and systemically it's important that we continue also highlighting the solutions that are there so they are not ready solutions and i think that's a big takeaway the, the it needs an integrated approach not just a developmental input and economic input being the, the the primary one that's just one part of the discussion the fundamental one being uh, issue of dignity and rights and uh, looking at all of these intersectionalities in a way that we don't reduce them to certain days or week uh, that are observed for this conversation it happens with everything that we do and that's why in bin wft my colleague aradhana who hands the gender work she has been talking a lot about how nutrition which audrey you brought out is a very important aspect that needs intervention a lot is built through that the acceptance of it by the women by the family almost reinforcing making women feel guilty if they start looking at their health and well-being in some ways uh, around nutrition uh, and i wish you know there was more conversation uh, there were more questions but uh, there are in many that have come in and i'm not going to uh, create few more because i i think we've covered a lot So uh, I don't know whether uh, Dr. Mahapatra is around, but I just would like to thank you all, all of you, really. And uh, I hope what comes out of this conversation will be transcribing it. We will get into more conversations in future, and uh, you know, share with you our research, our work that's going on. Good, Dr. Mahapatra, you're there. I just wanted to thank all of you, and I just thought that you know you 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 dropped off because of the construction activity being too loud around your house. But good to have you back. Uh, so uh, over to you, Aradna, and uh, for final words. And thank you, Sarika. It was a pleasure to reconnect with you. Uh, you revived some of the campaign days conversations, especially around uh, female PTI side. That was a very, very difficult uh, uh, campaign and a very difficult realization that we saw on the ground. Thank you, Audrey, for uh, weaving in everything. And of course, as passionately. you always talk about it uh, we feel the pain and we also feel the determination and we also feel all the other things that are being done legally statutorily towards it uh, thank you uh, dr mahapatra we we hope to connect with you a lot i was in odisha recently on on di project with aradhna and we yeah. we do have a lot of stories and experiences that you uh, pointed out many many uh, over to you aradhna yeah aradhna over to you uh, yeah thank you thank you parvinder and thank you to all the speakers this was indeed a very rich 
discussion and as uh, padnya has pointed out you know it was really uh, there was a lot of passion and conviction that was uh, embedded in the discussion it was i think uh, at least for me much as it was moving and concerning that the issue continues to be as serious as it was for so many decades there is also a ray of hope that we have people like the panelists here who are working on it and uh, i'm just hoping that all of us get that little inspiration and be able to in our own little rehabs make a difference about it do something about it just you know make an effort that this one in three figure does not continue for many more years so with these words i would like to thank you um, and i would also like to invite sukanya to kindly deliver a formal vote of thanks thank you thank you aradhana uh, on behalf of wfp india i would like to express my gratitude to all our esteemed uh, panelists here today uh, ms sarika ms audrey and dr shruti thank you for being with us and for accepting our request at such a short notice uh it was a very rich experience uh that you have shared with us today and i'm sure this is going to uh help us all all uh, i would like to uh thank all the participants who have been throughout uh with us through the webinar um i would like to extend my thanks to our co-organizing team here uh from the communications team parvinder and shamalima thank you so much uh for making this webinar happen and uh at the uh, towards the end i would like to thank all our colleagues here at wfp india uh, for participating in the 16 day of activism uh, and throughout the campaign period thank you everyone for joining us today bye okay, thanks thanks a lot everyone have a good day thank you thank you so much